Mr. Citizen, I'm going to show you what has been marked as exhibit number 363. Could you take a look at that and see if you recognize those records? I do. And what are those, sir? They are call records for mobile directory number 951-536-2162. And are those the exact same records that were reflected in uh, Exhibit 362 that you discussed a few moments ago? Yes. Okay. Now what I'd ask you to do again and renew my request, the, uh, just to refresh your memory, there were calls uh, your, your customer, what I was asking for is your customer, Mr. Alexander, uh, his number is what? 951-536-2162. Okay. And could you do me a favor then and highlight the calls Mr. Alexander made from that number to 831-402-1901. And if I may approach, Judge. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Citizen, if you could, Maybe we'll go through kind of a reorientation here um, in terms of how it works when the records go from your customer to another person, okay? Okay. All right. So it appears based on uh, what you told us before, the, the far col the col column to the far right, excuse me, is the person who is the calling party, correct? That is correct. Okay. And the dialed number here, that is the person that uh, your customer has called. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And then when we see this uh, column over here, that just relates to the uh, your trace on whatever number phone is being used. Is that accurate? That's one way of putting it, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't understand your answer. That is one way of putting it, yes. Okay. Did I put it in correctly? No, that column just shows that these records are for that number, 951-536-2162. Okay. Now, going back then, based on what you told us before, this column here uh, denotes the number of seconds that the call lasts, correct? Correct. Okay. So looking at this call on June 2nd at 3.04 a.m. Correct. And that is 1,011 seconds, correct? Correct. And again, I think we talked about a little before, that's probably over 16 minutes? It is. Okay. Can you calculate for us uh, what that is? It's about 18 minutes. Just under 18 What's, minutes. I'm sorry? Just under 18 minutes. Just under 18 minutes? Okay. And again, the recipient of that was the 831 number, correct? Correct. And just to bring it into view here, the dialer was the 951 number, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, if we go down a little farther, we have, I believe what we can see is another call on uh, the second. Well, they're definitely not dressed to match today, are they? <laughs> not today, they're not. She's dressed in red. Yeah, like the devil's mistress. Yes. A witch! A witch! A witch! And, uh, well, Jennifer Wilmot, the best thing that I can say about that is it's kind of downtown Abbey meets Dynasty, isn't it? Looks like, looks a bit Victorian. It does, doesn't it? It looks as though she's going to ring the bell and ask for tea, please, Jeeves. <laughs> And it looks like uh, 3.21 a.m., correct? Correct. Now, I said another call, and maybe that was incorrect assumption on my part. Is that is that accurate? You group some of the calls together on time, so I just want to make sure we're accurate. Well, this is its own individual. This one line represents one call. Okay. All right. And that call came from the 951 number, and it was... Uh, 2,450 seconds. Correct. Okay. And 
Uh, would you be able to do the math for us on how long a call that is? Just under 41 minutes. Okay. The voicemail features on Verizon. I think there was a, a standard voicemail and a, a deluxe or expanded voicemail. Is that the word you use? Enhanced. Enhanced. Okay. Does Verizon voicemail allow for someone to uh, erase their message and start over? Sometimes you get calls that say, if you're satisfied with your message, press blank. If not, yes. Yeah. Okay. So when you said that, it's, when you told this, Mr. Martinez that in your experience you thought someone was going in there, you really didn't know that for sure. They could have been erasing their messages and doing it over again. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Your Honor, that's all the questions I have. Redirect. So with regard to exhibit 363, this one with the blue lines on it and we talked about Did you see those blue lines there yes how many calls does that represent two and with regard to the totality of calls in exhibit 363 from Travis Alexander to the target number how many are there total in the whole record that you have in front of you calls from 951-536-2162 to the 831 number? Correct. In total, there were two. And if we do the other way from the 831-402-1901 number to Mr. Alexander's number, which is Exhibit 362, how many calls are there, sir? Fourteen calls to his two. What does that tell you? Well, it tells me that we're dealing with a psycho swamp donkey turd sucker. <laughs> you were asked in terms of how many calls had been made from Mr. Alexander's telephone out to the target number. Do you remember being asked that by defense counsel? And you said two, remember that? Yes. With regard to any calls being made by Mr. Alexander's number to this target number, were any of them made after June 4th, 2008, at 5.32 in the evening? No. And with regard to that particular date, were there any calls made from Mr. Alexander's number, period, after June 4th, 2008, after 5.32? I didn't look for that specific, but I'd have to look at the records again. Take a look at uh, Exhibits 362 or 363, whichever one will help you. There are no calls made from Travis's number. And by, in the reverse, how many calls were made to Mr. Alexander's number, either from Exhibit 362 or 363, from this target number that we've been talking about? Um, <coughs> overall. 831-402-1901 to Mr. Alexander's number after June 4th, 2008 at 532. How many? Four. Five and a half minutes. I don't have any other questions. 
Mr. Norman, did you have anything to follow up? I love what Martinez is doing here. He is rebutting every single bit of the defence's questioning with questioning of his own to establish what a liar she is. Exactly. Because, I mean, they were trying to hit the jury with, um, oh, yeah, he made these two calls to her. And then Martinez was like, well, she made 14 calls to him. Exactly. So who's the bigger plus, one? Plus four that were made after she'd killed him. Yeah, which they I mean, must have known. The, the, well, the about... jury are going to think, if, if they've not been, you know, presented with this, with a idea of this evidence yet they're going to think well why did she make four calls after she allegedly killed him and obviously that will come out later on in the trial but i can't remember if martinez has actually mentioned that or not that she called him after she killed him to try and keep up the pretense of he probably does but probably only mentions it to her maybe he might mention it with uh, the evidence well i've just wondered whether she, he's actually mentioned it in open court yet up to this point i, I can't remember I've i don't think he has it. i'm not sure if he has so if he hasn't then the jury are going to be scratching their heads thinking why did she call him four times sir i'm going to show you again what's been we'll use exhibit 363 could you tell us when these records begin? Uh, begin date and end date? May 31st of 2008 through June 15th of 2008. Okay. And these records don't reflect um, any text messages that were sent, correct? Correct. So the person in the 831 number, you don't know, they could have been responding to a text message or some other contact uh, to make these calls, correct? We don't know that with these you, records here. You wouldn't know that with those records? Correct. Okay, thank you. In terms of text messages, what is the retention policy for Verizon back in June of 2008? For text messages? We kept that information. We kept the date, the time, the number that sent the text message and number that received the text message for a year, a rolling year. Uh, the actual content of the messages we only kept for an average of three to five days. So the content for what was sent, you only kept for three to five days, right? Correct. And after the three to five days, what would happen to the message or the content? That information was overwritten on our servers and no longer available. I don't have any other questions. Any questions from the jury for this witness? Basically, the texts are, are moot now because um, Nermi established that, you know, text messages could have been sent, but Martinez established that there's no way to retrieve them. No, so you, no one knows. So what was the point of him, of Nermi? Because Nermi's going to know that. So Nermi... what's the point of him introducing that? Why, man? He's, he's doing everything he can to try and discredit the witnesses. Yeah, I know, but he's just asking questions, questions which he knows are just going to be... He's, it's as though he's launching a clay pigeon into the air and Martinez is like, oh, that's an easy target. Boom, boom. Yeah. Straight down. You know what I mean? That's how it feels at the moment, doesn't it? It does. Thank you. You may step down. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take the noon recess at this time. Please be back in the designated area at 1.25. Remember the admonition, you are excused. Your Honor, and we have certainly, we, yesterday we made a motion for mistrial, uh, and we will be providing some of the documents for prosecutorial misconduct. Um, the state has done it again. Uh, we have just, the state has elicited testimony that it knows to be incorrect um, because he talked about text messages not existing and them being erased, but in fact, um, those test messages were later disclosed after much litigation. So he has uh, brought forth uh, evidence from Mr. Citizen uh, that is inaccurate. I do have one other issue, but I'll rest on that. As cumulative and for the court's consideration to the documents we will submit, uh, hopefully later today or tomorrow. Mr. Martinez. The state 
doesn't know if these comments about the text messages are made just out of an ignorance or deceit. And I will leave that to the court to decide after reviewing the pleadings in this case. Mr. Citizen's testimony was that Verizon overrides or deletes these messages after three to five days. Everybody heard that. And yesterday when we discussed the telephone, the, and Detective Melendez was on the stand, he indicated that there is a program that goes to the actual telephone, whatever the exhibit number is of the telephone. And that at the time that he was going into the telephone, he doesn't work for Verizon. He works for the Mesa Police Department. So he has no connection to Verizon. But when he went to the actual telephone, the SIM card or the memory stick, whatever you want to call it, in that particular card. For example, if we're going to talk about the camera, if it's made by Canon, he didn't go to Canon to get the documents or the photographs. He went to the actual SIM card or the memory stick to get that information. The same thing with the telephone. He went to the telephone, attempted to get the text messages, and he said the technology was not available for me to extract it. I could view it, but I couldn't extract it. Once the technology was available to extract it from the telephone, not Verizon, then it became available to the defense two years ago. So I'm not sure why this argument was even made other than to waste somebody's time. I don't know whose time it's being wasted, but that it, it, it's just at this point, um, as I said, uh, the state is not sure if it was made out of ignorance or deceit. I'll leave that for you to decide. Mr. Your Honor, it's made out of another. It's made out of disgust. Um, what has happened here, and the state brings up an excellent point. The state has just elicited testimony that uh, these text messages aren't available for Mr. Citizen. And as the state has just alluded to, we heard yesterday, despite all the pleadings to the contrary, on January 11th, 2010, for example, the state says these text messages don't exist, uh, presumably based on um, the same kind of testimony Mr. Citizen's given, and now the story again changes. And as the state just pointed out, they're on the phone, so the state attempted to elicit testimony uh, to deceive uh, the availability of these text messages as it relates to uh, Ms. Arias' phone calls, trying to make it look like, well, we can't tell what happened when that's not true. So again, we will add this cumulative to the motion to the documents that we will submit today and just wanted to make a record of that. All right, your record is made. See you after lunch. Good. Yes. We are requesting uh, independent testing. Uh, some of the things that the state brought up during um, their case of what has been marked as MP, uh, Mesa Police Department e property ID number 402872. That is the Canon camera. I believe it was on the 28th of December. Ms. Wilmot and I uh, were able to at least view that, although we need to uh, do some forensic analysis on that. Uh, it was available in the Mesa PD property. We're asking that uh, Detective Flores bring this to court tomorrow to hand over to our investigators so that testing can be done. I asked for that specifically because last time we asked to test a hard drive, the state said that it wasn't available. They needed to find it and they surreptitiously uh, shipped it off to Texas. So we want to ensure that that doesn't happen this time and ask for a court order that uh, my investigator pick that up from Detective Flores tomorrow. What is the item you are asking to test? I'm, I'm using the Mesa Police Department ID number 402827. That is uh, a Canon camera that belonged to Miss Arias. It was originally seized by the Wairika Police Department using their denotation 4DY. From the state. These items have been available to the defendant throughout this whole trial. He could have taken that at any time. He could take them now if he wants to. I'll just have to consult with Detective uh, Flores to see if we could even get it down here today so that he can go about his way and take a look at something that's been available for the last four years. 
Do you have someone here today to take this item from Detective Flores if he brings it in? I can make calls over the lunch hour to see if I can obtain someone to do that. All right, we'll address this after the lunch hour. Thank you. We'll show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Martinez, you may call the state's next witness. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you, God? Yes, ma'am. Larry Gladish. Who do you work for? Mesa Police Department. Back in uh, June, uh, just 2008, did you work for the Mesa Police Department? Yes, yes I, I did. did. What area? I was in our homicide unit. And did you have occasion to assist in the investigation involving the killing of Travis Alexander? Yes, I did. And specifically with regard to that in his telephone, were you tasked or were you assigned to do something with regard to obtaining his uh, voice mail messages from his telephone. Yes, I was. And what's the process that you undertook? I wrote a court order to have the PIN number changed to his voicemail account so I could access the voicemail account. And what date was that? That would be June 25th, 2008. And after that, what did you do? How, did you, how were you able to access it? I called the voicemail from my desk phone and I recorded the uh, voicemail messages that were on his account. Take a look at uh, Exhibit 366. You familiar with this? Yes, I am. What are those two pages? They're called detail records. For what telephone number? 831 402 1901. You know the name of the person that, what, that is associated with that, right? Yes, I do. And what's the name that you believe is associated with that number? Jody Arias. And with regard to that particular number and the call log that's, that's involved, was there a call that you were interested in that was on June 4th, 2008 at 11.48 in the evening? Do you want to direct to this point where we approach? Mm -hmm. With regard to that particular call, did that involve 831-402-1901? Yes. And with regard to that call, was there a voicemail that you were able to obtain that was associated with that? Yes. Prior to coming to court, did you have occasion to listen to Exhibit 365? Yes, I did. And is that the voicemail? That was associated with that call that we just referenced? Yes, sir. I move for the admission of Exhibit 365. No objection. 365 is admitted. Anyway, right about the time you're starting to gear up. I know Leslie called you, so I already talked to her, so uh, you can call her back if you want, but it's not necessary. Um, my phone died, so I wasn't getting back to anybody. Um, and what else? Oh, and I drove 100 miles in the wrong direction. Over 100 miles, thank you very much. So, yeah, remember New Mexico? <clears throat> it was a lot like that. Only you weren't here to prevent me from going into the three digits. So, fun, fun. Tell you all about that later. Um, also, we were talking about, <clears throat> when we were talking about your upcoming travels my way, I was looking at the May calendar, duh. So, I'm all confused. Um, but Heather and I are going to see Othello on July 1st and we would love for you to accompany us. Um, I don't know when Teen Freedom's event is, though, but, you know, it's on the list, so we could do, um, we could do Shakespeare, Crater Lake, and the coast, so if you, make, if you can make it. If not, we'll just do the coast in uh, Crater Lake. But let me know, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.
End of message. To delete this message, press 7. To save it in the archive, press 9. To message will be saved for 21. Now to you, did that phone call sound like someone who had just suffered domestic abuse? No, and it certainly didn't sound like someone who had been attacked by two ninjas or by Bert and Ernie from Sesame Street. No, it didn't. No. Um, there's only one reason she left that message, and that message obviously wasn't intended for Travis because she'd murdered him by then. That was for the police saying, oh, it's okay. I wasn't anything to do with it. I was lost in the desert. Don't look for me. Look for someone else. Or look for people who don't exist. Yeah, like Bert and Ernie from Sesame Street. With regard to this particular message and reviewing those telephone records that you have in front of you, were you able to determine where the caller was when this call was placed? The caller would have been about 45 miles north of Kingman and about 27 miles, which is about 27 miles south of uh, the Nevada border, approximately. I don't have any other questions. Cross-examination. Good afternoon, Detective. Sir. A couple of quick questions for you, sir. Um, was that the uh, only voicemail that uh, was on Mr. Alexander's phone when you examined it? Well, I didn't examine the phone. Those are what I downloaded from the voicemail server that Verizon Wireless has, and there was more than one voicemail on there, yes. Right. Perhaps I ask it inartfully. The voice, you retrieved the voicemail. That wasn't the only voicemail. Correct. Right. Okay. And that wasn't the only um, phone that, or work that you were, did in this case, is that correct? You sought out other phone records, didn't correct. you not? Correct. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, and have you reviewed your police report recently? I have. Okay. Um, you sought out the records of a Dustin Thompson. Do you recall that? I did. Okay. <clears throat> and an Ashley Thompson, correct? Yes. Okay. And do you, what is your understanding of why you did that? Approach. <clears throat> Detective, drawing your attention back to um, the cell phone records of Dustin Thompson and Ashley Thompson. Um, what was your understanding of why you were asked to pull those records? I don't recall the specifics. I just know that they were named very early on in the investigation as maybe having some knowledge of what occurred. Okay. And based based on that, and who would have directed you to um, to search out those records? It could have been one of several people. It could have been Detective Flores, my my boss, any sergeant. You know, there were several people working the case at that time. It, uh, as the information comes in, I'm at the office. They call and say, "Hey, we got some." No information. Can you start working this? Okay. So you were asked by someone else to obtain these records and sought out court orders to get them. Is that correct? correct? Okay. And the voicemail messages, just for our understanding, uh, did you listen to all of them, not just the one we heard in court? Correct. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Are you right? I don't know any questions from the jury? It looks like we have one. <clears throat> Counsel, please approach. Juror question is, could you play the voicemail Exhibit 35? I could not hear it. Message. Hey, what's going on? It's almost midnight. Uh, anyway, right about the time you're starting to gear up. I know Leslie called you, so I already talked to her, so uh, you can call her back if you want, but it's not necessary. Um, my phone died, so I wasn't getting back to anybody. Um, and what else? Oh, and I drove 100 miles in the wrong direction. Over 100 miles, thank you very much. So, yeah, remember New Mexico? <clears throat> it was a lot like that. Only you weren't here to prevent me from going into the three digits. So, fun, fun. Tell you all about that later. 
Um, also, we were talking about <clears throat> when we were talking about your upcoming travels my way. I was looking at the May calendar, duh. So I'm all confused. Um, but Heather and I are going to see Othello on July 1st, and we would love for you to co accompany us. Um, I don't know when Teen Freedom's event is though, but you know it's on the list, so we could do um, we could do Shakespeare, Crater Lake, and the coast. So if you make, if you can make it, if not, we'll just do the coast and uh, Crater Lake. But let me know, and I will talk to you soon. Bye. End of message. To delete this message, press 7 to save it in the archives. Press 9 to he message will be saved for 21. Now, I can't remember if we mentioned this when we first heard it. I think it was probably... I'm not even sure if we've actually heard that or comment, commented on that actual thing before, have. that voicemail. But how natural does she sound? She, she sounds like she's talking to a friend. It, it, yeah, she sounds as though she's leaving her voicemail, you know, potentially for Travis. She does sound very natural, not a hint of nerves, not a hint of kind of regret at what she's done. And this is someone who was supposed to have left, been terrified for her life. Yeah. Being beaten by Travis. Yeah. Afraid for her life. Just murdered someone. Yeah. yeah. And also gave an explanation of, as we said before, the ninjas. But it also leads me on to my next point. Do you think she planned what she was going to say in that voicemail message? I think she did, yeah. I mean, there were lots of ums and ahs in there. But she probably sat and thought, well, what can I leave? What can I say to him on this message? That would sound natural. Yeah. Um, so she either probably made a list of stuff to talk about or stuff to mention in this message, or she could have just done it on the fly. And because she is clever, she could probably come up with stuff on the fly to talk about, like the trip to Othello and stuff yeah. like that. You know but what I mean? she um, also cleared her throat a lot. Yeah, she did. Did you notice that? Yeah. It's just interesting to speculate whether she planned what she was going to say or whether she did she it on the fly. She probably did, or knowing her with her cunning, bleeding head, she can come up with anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, just It just, just struck me as we were listening to that, you know. Yeah. Any other questions from the jury? Any follow-up counsel? No, thank you. Just one quick question, Detective. Do you know the date and time that that message was left? That would be June 4th at 11.48 uh, p.m. Okay, and that's based on what, what you heard in the recording? No, the phone records. Okay. And that message, uh, I don't know if you can answer this now, but was that, was that deleted off the voicemail or was that fresh on the voicemail? The way you heard it is the way it played on the voicemail when I accessed the voicemail. Okay. So you didn't have to go into other areas to like check deleted messages or anything. It was just correct. There. That's the way it played right there. Okay. But I mean, but it was just there. It was in the box with a bunch of other messages, right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Adding to our last comment, it's also worth wondering whether she, I mean, I'm not sure whether she's mentioned this or if it's been mentioned in court, but it's also worth wondering whether she knew his pin for his phone voicemail. Because she could have gone in if she decided that that was a bad idea to delete it. However, having said that, if she'd have gone in and deleted that after Travis's death, that would have been a huge red flag because they would have wanted to know who deleted it. And why. And why. Yeah. Um... So I'm guessing she probably did know the pin of his voicemail. Um, and I'm guessing that it crossed her mind that it may have been a mistake to leave that message. But I think she was also smart enough to think, well, if I delete it, will that bring them to me? Will they be able to trace that to me? Exactly. So yeah, she had to think quick. Yeah. I'm just kind of thinking, trying to put myself in her head at the time she committed these murders. She left that message roughly just over six hours after she murdered him. As we said before, she doesn't sound shaken. She doesn't sound as though she'd been through a major trauma, um, being held hostage by um, either Travis or these two ninjas, being physically abused, being emotionally abused. Yeah. There was none of that present. If that was the case, 
your question is very valid and still stands. Why would she leave a message for someone who earlier in the day was treating her so bad, so badly, and nearly where to the point her life was supposedly in danger? It does not make sense. That does not add up. It is not logical. We always say we look for what is logical in exactly. this, and that does not add up. At Why all. would you leave a voicemail like that for someone who's supposedly beating you emotionally? Exactly. Phys physically, uh, and she had no marks on and, her. And the way a story kept flippy flopping as well. Yes. Um, you know, it, it wasn't me. It was these two bloody ninjas, these I wasn't two muppets. I was there, and then all and of then, a sudden it was these two ninjas, and, and then, then, then all yeah, of a sudden. Yeah, it was me. Yeah, it was me, but he was beating the shit it out was of me. It was self defense. Yeah. What, an, uh, what a crock of absolute bollocks. You may step down. The state may call its next witness. The state recalls the Detective Esteban Torres. Mm. Detective, you are still under oath. Do you understand? Yes, I do. Your name, sir? Esteban Flores. And, sir, um, with regard to the handgun that was used in this case, uh, did the police find a handgun back at Mr. Alexander's home? No, we did not. Did you attempt to find the handgun? Yes, we did. And were you able to find the handgun? No. In the knife, was the knife back at the home uh, when the police went through the home? We never found the knife used. And did the police attempt to look for the knife? Yes. Where did you guys attempt to look for both the knife and the gun? Uh, all through the house, around the house. How about outside of the house? Yes. How about in other places? Did you go to different towns or? No, we did. Well, we went to Wairika and we attempted to find it there during the search warrants that we did there. Did you have any idea where this knife could, or and gun could possibly be? No. They're probably buried in the Nevada desert somewhere. Yeah, or the Utah desert, or maybe uh, they were thrown into a river or something. Who knows? All we know is I don't think they'll ever be found. I don't think they will. Now, sir, uh, we were talking when we left off about conversations that you may have had with the defendant back on June 15th of 2008. Do you remember that? Yes. And we left off where there was this issue about photographs and you were telling her that you were going to show her some photographs, correct? Yes. Did you eventually show her some photographs? Yes, I did. And does Exhibit 358 describe your conversation with her involving the photographs as you were showing them to her? Yes. I move for the admission of exhibit 358. 358 is admitted. Now, from here on in, the trial covers material that we've already provided commentary on, I think, in part two. I think it's part two because she's not wearing her orange jumpsuit. Yeah. Um, but we're going to go over it again because, once again, we believe in being thorough. Um, and in this one, I believe that you see a side by side of Jody in court next to the actual recording. So that's going to be interesting. Yeah. So hopefully we'll be able to provide, you know, either a bit more insight and elaborate on the stuff we commented on in part two, or maybe look at her reactions to what's going on on screen. Exactly. But yeah, this is going to be interesting, isn't it? Very.
just been reminded of something else um, from an analogy I've made before in the Chris Watts case. What she's doing with her face there, do you remember the beginning of American Psycho where Patrick Bateman is talking about the various nutrients and masks and stuff that he's putting on his face? He does that exact same thing. Psycho? Yeah. Don't I just... That just occurred to me when I saw that again. I can't remember whether I mentioned that in part two. I think two, you did. But he does the exact same thing. Whoever that is put in a brew or make one for us. Coffee for both of us. Just takes two sugars. I don't. I'm sweet enough. I really hope this isn't part of the re recording where she starts singing. Oh, God, please not. Yeah, I think we're going to have to, if she does, we're going to have to take care of the cats. You know what happened last time? Yeah. Yeah. Cats they didn't shut up. up for ages, did they? No.
It's a Glock. I just bought a gun. Yeah, Jim? Mm -hmm. You probably found it by now. Probably. I was taking it somewhere. These are just a few photos. And I want to be careful showing, not showing you certain photos Please because some of them me. are very <coughs> bad. That's obviously Travis's house, right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. Travis is telling me is that Jody did this to me. Have you ever shot that 25 Mm-hmm. Have you ever touched it? The one that was stolen? No, I've never seen it. Like your grandpa said, it looks like a toy one. Mm-hmm. I don't know what a 25 looks like. I know what a 22 looks like. It's just like a 22, actually. Well, the 22s that I saw kind of looked like the ones in the westerns where they had the barrel and the long. You know. But there was another 22 in this in this store that looked like a toy gun, so it looked like a squirt gun, like a water gun. Soon after you and him had sex on his bed. That couldn't have been too soon after. Mm, an hour or so. The last time two I hours. Sex on his bed was an eight. Why the fuck you lying? Why you always lying? Yeah, and that would be enough to curdle anyone's cream, wouldn't it? Especially ours. Yeah. I mean, if she's got eyes like raisins, then she's probably got sultanas for nipples and figs for a minge. Then I've seen all the traps. But the one that sticks in my mind of Travis is on the autopsy table. I'm not going to show you that. Or should I? 
but this one I don't know if I should show you, but not too bad, too bad. But it's just one of the photos that was taken by accident. And this is just a small portion of it. It's your foot, Jody. These are your pants. No, it's off color because we had to enhance it and the color kind of changes a little bit. Let's try this. This is his bathroom. That is not my foot. It's a different color, like I said, because we had to enhance it and the color changes. The zipper back. I have both of those pants at home, if these are the same one. I don't have a zipper there, though. Not on mine. And this is a black stripe, and this is white, and the black goes around with one, too. So. Couldn't even recognize Travis. He'd been there so long. I keep thinking of Brother High and I dress him. No, well, this is another one that's just a copy, but it's you. Same day. All time stamped, all everything. First picture here. Let's see. Have you noticed during this bit she's not acting like cousin it anymore? She's turning her face towards the jury. Yeah. Mind you, look at her hair. She looks as though she's combed it with a pork chop, doesn't she? She does. The date, 6, 4, 8, 10, 5, 22 p.m. That's when it started. Photo view started, you know, in Travis's bedroom. About 1.30, 1.45, something like yeah. that. Um, I don't know what kind of camera you got. Yeah. Right there, can see that? See the spots here? They look a different color because we used a chemical to enhance this. Mm -hmm. That right there, blood. It's a mixture of yours and his. And that's your palm print. Of your left palm. I don't have any cats on my left palm. Mm -hmm. Nobody said that. Your cut was a palm. Do you have any recent cuts that are healing? Well, my cat scratches me. Little things. These are all her work. You can see. This is her. That's her. I've got scars. She's very, she's a feral cat. All these little things are her. Well, enough about your cat, but... Why is your paw print in blood? Uh, how can that be my paw print? Because you were there. Probably a thousand different reasons why, in her mind, this was justified. Yeah. And I'm sure that part of her languishing in prison now still thinks that she was justified in killing him. 
Yeah, but the only thing was, and what is a fact, he wasn't interested in her. Yeah. And that's the only reason she did it. The, yeah, she she was an absolute raving, unchecked psychopath with yep. a very unhealthy obsession with someone who didn't return or did not reciprocate. That's those same emotions that she had for him. He tasted a little bit of her. He kept her around for, you know, a booty call, if you like. Yeah. Right or wrong, the guy's not here anymore, so he can't defend himself. It's wrong for anyone to judge him. What we can say is it's, you know, he wasn't a saint. We're not disparaging him by saying that. No, we we keep saying he wasn't a saint. We know that, you know, he had weaknesses like this. Of course he did. Doesn't make, him a, doesn't make him a bad person. Nope. And it's sh sure as hell he didn't deserve what happened to him. Exactly. So, I don't get this whole, there was no reason for it. Because all it took was good detective work to dig out the reasons for it. But not just good detective work, a damn good lawyer to prosecute the crime. Oh, yeah. There's no way anybody else. He could... never raped me. Nobody. Never. There's no way anyone else could have left your palm print in blood on that wall. No way. Get that through your head. If I was going to ever try to kill somebody, I would use gloves. I've got plenty of them. I would have said you were. You know, you had planned this out perfectly. Maybe you were going there to just talk to him. Have a good time with him. Something got out of hand. Even if I were there, and even if I were going there to just have a good time with him... What if I tell you somebody saw you there? A neighbor. Do you remember some of the neighbors? Just the... you? The next door neighbor? Mm -hmm. His wife? Mm -hmm. Okay, what about some of the neighbors across the street? No, I've never met them. No, but you've, you've hung around there quite a bit and they know you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've seen you there on that day. I wasn't there that day. Jody, you were there that day. And even if I, I'm trying to think, the, the, the majority of the time that I spent there, I had platinum blonde hair. So, I mean, and I've never once said hi to them, met them, shook their hand, met them face to face, crossed the street. When I spent time there, he wanted to keep it private, so it was, um, I spent the majority of my time inside. Not, you know, walking around outside. Yeah, but what Jodie forgets is that curtain twitches are universal. Yeah, we've got them here as well, haven't we? Yeah, nosy neighbours. <laughs> it's a common thing. It is. In this case, it's a good thing. Well, yeah. Except for a few times when I took his dog for a walk. Would they see your car there? Or would you park it down the street? No, they would see it there. I drove an Infinity. So they would definitely recognize the car, I'm sure. Because, well, there are a lot of cars there a lot of the time. Where's the Infinity now? Just, I gave it back to the bank. To the impound yard somewhere? Mm -hmm. Are we going to find any evidence in that car? You're free to look. I don't want to look. You can also look in the rental car. What company did you rent it from? I don't remember, but I can check my, um, I can check my, my debit card record. Okay. I remember them making models. Well, we're waiting for it anyway. But you know all the new cars have GPSs in them. Oh. Factory. Not for you well, to then use, that's good. but for us to use if we need to. Well, then that's good because I was also going to ask you. I don't know if this is something that you can recall, but a lot of the stoplights in Mesa and things have cameras on them. <coughs> is there any way we could back that up, or you know, if I were going to Phoenix, going through that tunnel, is that surveillance? No. Is there surveillance anywhere? Unless you ran a red line. 